think people don't realize that to do things well and to help local economies prosper and for people to grow, it doesn't just mean um, here's a one-off payment. I help you to do this. This uh, I don't know. Uh, buy something, but um, really, it's building a whole ecosystem. So my family were entrepreneurs when they fled Hungary, and, and they were refugees, and they restarted lives in the U.S. And so they had this this feeling that you had to work hard and and earn your money and save it and be very good. And so my grandparents um, during the revolution, so really they lost everything. This was in the 50s. My cousins have a foundation. My family also has a foundation to um, support Hungarians living outside of the borders to get an education. Welcome to Seed Stars podcast. Seed Stars is an organization that aims to have an impact in emerging markets by supporting the local entrepreneurs, investing in their ventures, but also sharing their story globally because we really believe they are the true heroes. We'll be listening to them and other thought leaders and disruptors that are really shaping the future of tomorrow. And we hope that together we can build a sustainable impact. So uh, welcome to Seed Stars podcast. Today we are very lucky to have Tenke Zoltani with us. I'm very excited to have a chat with you, Tenke, because I've heard a lot about you, especially from Alize that you've been meeting a couple of times now over the past few years. Um, I, I won't uh, say too much about you because I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, but basically, you're active in the impact investment space for a couple of years now. Uh, you've been uh, working, among others, at, at UBS, launching impact investment uh, activities there. Uh, but please, introduce yourself, and, and then I guess we can jump in. Sure. Um, so I'm Tenke. I founded Better Finance uh, some years ago now. So it's working in impact investment advisory, primarily targeting families, but also working increasingly with institutional investors. So really impact investment focused from origination to execution. Um, before that, professionally, as you said, I was at UBS, the leading impact investment advisory for the ultra high net worth segment of the bank. Um, and then before that, worked in, in asset management and in climate change finance. So um, helping large companies as well as investors identify good opportunities that make a positive social impact primarily around the environment, uh, but also a financial return. So that's been my trajectory really over the last uh, 10 plus years now um, from a professional standpoint. And do you see yourself more as, as an investor or as an entrepreneur? Because you founded this company seven years ago now. Uh, so you're an entrepreneur yourself, right? I don't really consider myself that because I think it takes away from what things that people like you are doing and seed stars uh, i didn't have a brilliant idea i think i'm very good at execution but uh, uh, i haven't really created anything new or invented something i saw a need in the market and that's what i'm working to serve but um, i have friends like like you guys that really are entrepreneurs that have built something from scratch that is meeting a, a huge societal challenge and i don't know i guess i, I don't see myself in such a light um, but more as somebody who yeah, who can execute well. But somehow, yeah, I mean, you, you because you left the corporate world, uh, you left also the, 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 the status as an employee and you have to find clients and figure out how you're going to pay the bills, etc. So in some way, that's why I'm, I was asking, some way you're, you also face some of the challenges that some of the entrepreneurs that you are supporting are facing. Do, do right. you think that... It, that it helps you a bit maybe in your work as well? No, you're absolutely right. And I think working with some entrepreneurs now through this uh, coronavirus crisis, I really see um, operators, how they are looking for new customers and um, struggling to make the cash flow work. And I think, uh, again, it um, I feel like we're in an industry and impact, which is a little bit immune to these shocks because it's it's growing so quickly. It's um, it's inelastic demand in a way. So uh, for sure, it's a, I'm, a, I'm a female founder from that perspective, and I guess an entrepreneur, but I just I see the blood, sweat and tears of people building um, uh, brick and mortar businesses or, or really large companies like yours. And I, I, I guess I don't see myself in, in the same light as, as I would someone like you. Okay, but I, I I do see you as an entrepreneur because I, again you you're not uh, you're not employed by someone and, and you need to to face these challenges. Um, so um, another j just to better understand better finance. So your main job is to advise um, these uh, high net worth individuals mainly, I guess, uh, and also institutional investors mm -hmm. or, or not? Both. So in fact, okay. it was more family focused or individual focused a few years ago when um, the bulk of the business was around um, originating direct investment opportunities and then helping these investors execute them, diligence them, um, 
value them, negotiate them, and then close them. And now I think just because of the, the interest in sustainability and sustainable investing, there's a big push from the institutional investor community who either wants to launch their own investment products or um, at the basic level among asset managers, they need help in integrating environmental, social, and governance into how they um, execute day-to-day uh, -day transactions or um, how they help their clients um, better understand what are environmental, social, and governance criteria. So it's, I think, a little bit, a little bit lighter, but very important from a regulatory perspective. So the business, I think, is... Um, yeah, it's segmented, probably 60% institutional at the moment, and then the rest uh, private. So your customers, when you say they split. Okay. Mm -hmm, for sure. Yeah. And, and, and how, how would you describe the impact investment? How, how is that different from any other investment, actually? Um, it's really, I, when people ask me that, I say it's about intentionality. So you as an investor have an intention to um, seek results, seek returns that are not purely financial, but also trying to make a positive change or positive impacts in society or in the environment. So it's adding another dimension to um, purely financial investing. So I think um, this can envelop really a broad, broad range of investments. So I really leave it up to the investor to think about it and, and define it themselves. But I think broadly intentionality is the most important in making an impact. So that's tricky because you could be an impact investor by accident also. So where you invest in a company that ends up having a big impact, but as you didn't have initially this intention, you would not consider yourself as, as an impact investor. Is that correct to say that? Yeah, I, it's, uh, I think you can get into a lot of arguments with people about this. But uh, for me, fundamentally, it is about intention. So when you sit down with these, um, these entrepreneurs or the investors themselves, it needs to come out in the conversation that, they are um, out there to make an impact, um, which, yeah, again, this is very subjective, but in working with a few investors right now and uh, companies in Africa, by virtue of being in, in um, let's say, uh, targeting poor communities or even middle income um, African consumers, they say, well, we're creating employment, we're helping, I don't know, identify new energy sources or invest in infrastructure, so it's impact. But if their goal is really just to make money because they see a good opportunity, I think it's not a very strong impact story. But this is something that's quite personal. So that's why I let, I don't prescribe this to my clients, but if they ask me, I'm very honest about it. How do you, um, when you're talking to, to, your, um, to your investors, uh, you, you say, I guess, that you, they're looking for market returns for uh, maybe not all of them. I guess some of them uh, put the impact before profit? Uh, I don't know exactly. Maybe you know more. What is the split? Like, what are they really looking for? Are they looking for market returns? Or? In, my, in my experience, yes. And I only work with investors that want market or actually better than market returns. I know there is a small segment that will forego this. It happens more on the philanthropic side. So I worked with clients that wanted to transition some of their foundation assets or philanthropic assets into impact. And there they don't really care so much about the return. But if you talk to the family offices or, or the asset managers, uh, for sure they want commercial returns. So, so market or better, um, particularly if they're taking bigger risks. So again, in places like, um, I mean, just to generalize sub-Saharan Africa, uh, they, they are going to want that premium. And, and what do you call market returns? How much is that? I mean, looking at venture capital just two weeks ago, uh, yeah, I mean, 15, 20% minimum, but it's, I mean, it's, mm. it's VC, so it comes with huge risks. Um, I mean, really the expectations are even 30, 30% plus. Um, but generally looking at private equity, uh, yeah, I think seven to 12% has become more the norm, the expectation and a little bit less for debt. Um, these have certainly come down, I think over the last decade, but still the expectation is that because you are looking at something that's in the private markets, um, even if it's in a place like Switzerland, there's still an expectation that um, you're taking risk and, and it is pr uh, traditional private equity. So you want to make double digit returns. And you mentioned that there, there was this, this big trend around the, this, in this sector. Um, where do you think is it coming from? Is it the new generation? Like we talk about these millennials that are coming now that are... Um, starting to be in charge of the family businesses and they're more interested by that topic by default because I know they might be more informed about the, these, these issues. Um, they have another, another way maybe to approach business in general. Is that also what, what you feel on, on, in the market? 
Uh, I think, yes, from a millennial perspective, there is a demand, but there sometimes isn't so much financial literacy. So yes, they want to make an impact or do things more sustainably, but it doesn't necessarily always coincide with how you would execute a transaction or how you would put together a, an investment portfolio. So yes, on the one hand, certainly some demand. I think most of the demand actually is really regulatory driven. So um, if we look into the future a little bit next year and the year after, we have a, this new regulation from the EU that says all of these people that have made claims about the SDGs or um, being sustainable, they will actually have to show what they're saying uh, and prove it somehow. So I think companies and investors are now scrambling to say, okay, we have seen that the sustainable development goals, the SDGs, which now you find on every website, you see it um, no matter where you go on any investment presentation, um, this was a good barometer for the world to say we want to achieve these goals by 2030 that investors started to adopt. So I think that answers your question to some extent on, on why this push. Um, but nobody really measured what they were doing or could prove that what they were saying in terms of meeting five SDGs was true. So now we have the regulators that say, fine, you cannot just sell these products to um, other people without actually proving your claims. Um, so if we look then at regulation on the one hand at issues like the sustainable development goals being very uh, widespread and then of course millennial demand, I think these three have come together at the same time. Everybody is looking for something that's uncorrelated, that's uh, well diversified. So if you have something um, that's not linked so closely to the financial markets, um, like investing in some of these social businesses or, or not even social businesses, just uh, impact investments, then you have a good diversifier in your portfolio. And, and that makes me think of this, this whole discussion about, because it's easy to, to measure the financial return. Now uh, it's, it's a bit more difficult to measure the impact return. So how do you handle that? Uh, because I know that there's so many models out there now, so many people trying to come up with solutions on, on how to measure impact. How do you handle it, with, especially with the investors? What do you kind of sell to them? I try to keep it as, as really, I mean, to put it crudely, just as cheap as possible from the perspective of this will not add tons of time for reporting or record keeping or building tons of additional capacity and having you do workshops, nor will it impose this burden on your portfolio companies. So I think if you adopt a light touch and use something that's already available on the market, so we can say um, we have the sustainable development goals. We're going to choose five of them. Uh, we're going to just download the Excel that's available to everyone that says these SDGs have, uh, I think it's like 180 indicators. You can choose which ones are most relevant to your organization, your portfolio. And then when you do your financial reporting quarterly, then you also track these indicators. You can go one step further and there's a a catalog of metrics, I don't know how many thousand metrics now called uh, IRIS, so it's the impact reporting, I should know what it's called, it's been around for a decade and I'm using mm -hmm. it. Anyway, it's IRIS and it's a catalog of indicators, so um, there you can find everything from, uh, okay, we want to know how many um, female clients are served, we want to know how many uh, kilowatt hours of renewable energy are produced, and you say, uh, okay, we draw on these 20 metrics. So. You put together a, a set of indicators that are, are clearly quantifiable and measurable. Um, you tie that to whatever your overarching key performance indicators are. So maybe your investment wants to help improve, I don't know, the lives of, of poor farmers in Malawi. And then you, you do something proprietary, but uh, it doesn't have to be very intense. Um, and that way you have a record for yourself, for your investors, for your investees. And then you can also see over time if these companies are performing better perhaps because they are making a, a positive impact. And, and how do you handle these, these criticisms sometimes of people saying that you're doing business from the poor or making money on, on, on the poor? So it, how, do you, how do you handle that kind of criticism? Um, if it's a question of just delivering essential goods and services, I don't, I'm personally, I don't really have a problem with this. I'm, uh, I try to be very pragmatic and realistic. Uh, I think if you are helping to develop um, health clinics where people do have to pay and they have some ability to pay, then you're, you're doing a, a net benefit. Likewise with delivering clean water, I don't think things should be given away for free. They should be priced appropriately. Most people though, I think will really struggle to invest and, and make a profit on purely the base of the pyramid. So when you do have an example like um, healthcare infrastructure, then normally you're targeting more the, the middle inco income consumer in places like Southeast Asia, 
but you have a subsidized model for the poor. So there's a way to, to combine the two and still help to develop the, um, the poor communities. The one issue that I think is important is looking at things like debt and microfinance and making sure that it's pri priced appropriately. So of course you've had these examples, everyone points to in India over um, farmer financing that went bad over uh, very high levels of interest. So I think you have to be cautious with something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it, there was a very good paper from Omidyar Network mm -hmm. um, about the topic saying that they would target like these, what they call LMI, so low and middle income segments, but the the approach on the lowest income segments would be more um, uh, with grants and, and similar kind of, of, of philanthropic approach. Uh, because it's very difficult to monetize um, to monetize this segment. Is it also something that that you've seen? Yourself? That's something I would I would put to you and to Seed Stars because you're doing so much work in these markets. Yeah. I'm for sure more than I am. I think yes, these subsidized models are are sometimes good in the short term, but it's very difficult to find the grant funding. I think to mm. um, yeah, as soon as you say subsidy, everyone that's free market wants to run away. Uh, my mind is not made up about subsidized models because when I was working on um, on cooking stoves, so clean cooking stoves for especially for base of the pyramid communities. Once you subsidize something, there's an expectation that either it will continue to be subsidized, um, it will be free, it won't really be invested into again. So I think it, it also depends on the, the community where you are providing these subsidies and what's the expectation. Have they been in a in a um, under a government which is used to I don't know if a, a socialist approach and um, and providing things free of charge, or are they really driven by capitalism and they do have an expectation that we can make a business out of this? So, uh, yeah, I think it's tough. Um, I generally, in the investments I work with, generally stay away. Yeah, and and now more personally, how, what's what's your relationship with with money? Because you're surrounded by people that are extremely uh, wealthy. Um, you you see large amounts around you, and so. How do you? What is your your uh, yeah your view on money person from a personal perspective? Do you see it also as a as a as an indicator of success? How, what is your relationship with that? Uh, I remember when I was small, so I have three brothers, and uh, every I grew up uh, mostly in the U.S. and my parents are, are immigrants there, and they had this very strong. Um, uh, so my family were entrepreneurs when they fled Hungary, and and they were refugees, and they restarted lives in the U.S. and so they had this this feeling that you had to work hard and, and earn your money and save it and be very good. And they gave each of my brothers and I $1 a week in allowance. And I would uh, store mine up. Um, I saved like $300. Like I hid it away. I put it in a box somewhere. My brothers would always spend it. They would uh, break in actually and steal all my money once or twice. Mm -hmm. So it's, I don't know, but I think I'm, I'm conservative myself in how I invest and approach money. And, um, I don't know. It's it's you're right. You see and you work with very wealthy people that are considered ultra high net worth. So they have 50 million or more um, in uh, in assets. And I, I don't know. I think you don't you don't consider it because you see the scale of the problem of of uh, things like homelessness right now or food security or or um, health crises and how to solve them. And yes, this is significant money, but uh, it just takes so much more and so many people collectively working together to to solve any of this. So me personally, yeah, I guess I'm quite conservative. I'm not a, a big spender. I like probably like other millennials to um, go on nice trips and, and splash out on things like uh, private Pilates and um, eat really nice foods in exotic locations. But uh, yeah, beyond that, I think it's a luxury to not have to think and stress about it too much. Um, but that said, I mean, I don't want to sound... Uh, uh, unsympathetic in a time right now with coronavirus where it's affecting many people in very serious ways. So um, yeah, I think from being very capitalistic and driven, driven like this, I now see the benefits of having a system where, um, for example, you do provide cash transfers to people and let them figure out what to do with it when they're in difficult situations, or um, I guess it's an evolution. So as you travel and see different policies and see different situations on how you approach it, um, yeah, but me personally, not not a big spender, more of a saver. Uh, yeah, it's it's nice to be comfortable, but um, I mean, I'm not striving to reach the level of some of my clients. Yeah. So I don't know if it happened to you, but uh, so I've lived also in in some emerging markets. I've lived in Lagos for for a year, and and I must say that um, 
sometimes a bit schizophrenic because I then I come back to Geneva. Uh, so we we man there is I think one third of the private wealth worldwide that is managed in Geneva in in Switzerland. And there, there are these crazy amounts around you. And on the other side, maybe five hours flight away, uh, I was, I was basically hanging out with people that don't even have a penny um, to live. And and it's just like I said, just five hours flight away. And I cannot take that out of my mind all the time. You know, when I'm here, and then you go to a cocktail, and everything is super fancy, etc. And you know that, uh, yeah. Just on the other side, like there, there are all these these people in need, and for some reason, you, you at least on my side, it's difficult to forget that. Um, and I'm saying, and it's difficult also to explain to the people around you without being too, um, I would say, boring and and a bit annoying. You know, uh, is it also something that that you live around you or that that you experience a bit? Yes, because as I said, my family were, um, they had emigrated from Hungary. So this was with their grandparents or my grandparents um, during the revolution. So really, they lost everything. This was in the 50s, uh, from the 40s to the 60s. And still, uh, much of my family lives in Hungary, um, or Transylvania. So very often times very remote in rural parts of um, now Romania. And in fact, you do see it. And Uh, sometimes the argument from from my cousin so um, my cousins have a foundation my family also has a foundation to um, support Hungarians living outside of the borders to get an education like oh why don't you uh, donate more or um, I don't know give money or build a school or uh, I think people don't realize that to do things well and to help local economies prosper and for people to grow it doesn't just mean Um, here's a one-off payment. I help you to do this, this, uh, I don't know, uh, buy something, but um, really it's building a whole ecosystem. I think like Seedstars is actually doing um, to put the social and the economic infrastructure in place for people to thrive. So, and you can do that outside of Switzerland far more cheaply than trying to build it here. So I think your impact can be greater, but yeah, it's, um, it really is, is, different context by context. And of course, it's fantastic to go to Hungary and spend like a third of what you would hear on, on food or, or going out and doing things. Um, yeah, I think Switzerland's a very unique uh, ecosystem where it's true, you get a little bit jaded and you don't think about uh, yeah, the price of things or, or how the economy is built here versus other markets like Hungary or certainly emerging markets like Africa. Um, Yeah, so I think when you step out of your your Swiss landscape, it's I don't know, it's hard. I haven't I haven't thought about it like you have. The background of your family, um, they they like you said, they were they are uh, refugees. Uh, do you think it had an impact on your choices and especially your career choice of working in in that impact investment um, uh, arena, or or not necessarily, or something else that made you cho choose this this uh, career path? I think maybe some of it's genetic. So my grandfather had a very successful business um, around uh, catering and uh, and pastries and uh, the confectionery in Hungary. And then when he ended up in the U.S., he rebuilt this to the point of uh, even making a cake for the White House. So it's like my mother's pride. So proud of this story. So perhaps there's something like that genetically. Um, but in terms of this impact. Angle. In fact, uh, my parents, because of how they were, they said, well, you should really study medicine because everybody will always need doctors. And now we're certainly seeing it. And so they really pushed me to study medicine, medicine. And uh, uh, when I went to university, it just wasn't, I just, it wasn't for me. I just didn't enjoy it. Um, my brothers did, and they did uh, not, not much better, but they, they found their career path like that. Um, for me, I liked urban studies and my father said, you'll never get a job. Uh, so I ended up in economics. Um, But through that, when I got to my master's program, I was able to link economics and environment and the climate change market. So trading carbon and solving these problems of pollution with financial markets was really interesting and appealing to me. So I think it was a little bit um, by chance or uh, not something I could have predicted, but I loved the environment. I loved, uh, I don't know, animals and nature. And um, somehow putting this together with economics was really interesting. So When I finished my master's degree, there was an opportunity. Um, so, you know, you apply to all these graduate programs. I looked at uh, trading for Shell, um, looked at the big four, so in corporate finance and received some corporate finance offers and also an offer from a startup to work in a, a carbon consultancy. 
So it was, it was really not much pay, but it seemed really exciting. It was a company of three people. Um, so I ended up there and then really falling in love with how to solve these environmental externalities with financial solutions. So I think that's something I could have predicted. Um, in fact, I ended up in Geneva because an oil company had hired me to help them build a CO2 trading business. So again, linked to the environment, but for, um, yeah, for essentially for the fossil fuel industry. Uh, and then because they had pulled out of that opportunity, I ended up in Geneva anyway, and then um, ended up uh, working with a, uh, a gentleman I knew from the carbon markets who was starting an asset management business linked to um, food, water, and energy investments. So yeah, I think when when younger people ask me now about career trajectories and, and paths, I think it's more about who you meet and where you are at that time and what's going on in the world, which is probably not very sound advice, uh, but it's, that's how I ended up doing this. And and also at some point in your career, like we said before, you, you became some kind of an entrepreneur. Uh, what made you choose this, this path? Because you could have continued basically in the in to work with the other company you were working for or changing uh, and still still um, remain um, an employee why, why launching your own company i really didn't like so working for a small company was was a lot of fun but then as the company grew and matured from three people to 20 then your responsibilities changed they shrunk you had new management you had a lot more rules and structure uh, and that was in in london and then here the oil company it was so regimented and strict and you had to be at your desk at a certain time and do the same things every day and it drove me absolutely crazy I was I was miserable and then um, from there worked with another growing company which was great but had its own difficulties and um, finally at the time so the carbon markets were doing uh, badly we had um, made a big acquisition in London which was going really well but I didn't want to move and the transition of of um, trying to start something on my own just made sense. So um, when I had left the company, I think, uh, I mean, I can say uh, actually with a lot of appreciation for the Swiss government, they really bless you with time during unemployment. You can take uh, the chômage and try to figure out, yes, either if you want another job or you work with them and say, I want to start a business, can you give me some, um, some time? And uh, of course you've paid into the system so you can take advantage. So. I really did take advantage, I think a good year to think about um, different options around Switzerland and how I could keep working with social enterprises. And in that time I had met a family who wanted to invest in this way and had a few different opportunities. So from a bank pretty quickly uh, to do some consulting. And so really this, this whole business grew out of, a, yeah, again, a bit of, of networking of people that I saw that really cared about this. And then also having met some social businesses Um, so one, for example, in Liberia, working in Coco, who needed help and needed uh, sound financial advice, but really wanted to make an impact. So I think over the span of, of maybe a year, maybe even 18 months, just putting together a, um, yeah, I guess, I guess they're clients now, but at the time I didn't think about it that way. And then it grew organically um, because I'm someone that's very curious, that loves to go out and meet people and And the building, the building, the, the business sort of grew and developed uh, on its own pretty organically, of course, with a lot of work, but just by the nature of what was going on in the market and who um, we're surrounded with in Geneva. So you, you say you're someone very curious, uh, but curiosity is not enough to launch a business. You're also very driven. And that makes me think of your other part, uh, which is the sports. You're doing a lot of sports, if I'm not mistaken. How many hours do you train um, a week? So less now, and especially under this. So work has really taken over running. Um, now that they've delayed the Olympics by a year, though, it gives me a lot of hope. So I'm scrambling a little bit, but um, I was running semi-professionally after university. So running for Nike, um, I had competed uh, quite seriously in the US. And then, uh, yeah, I ran for Nike. I was injured really within a month. I've never worn white Nike shoes before, and they just, they weren't right for how I run. And So I took time off. That was when I moved to London, uh, did the whole partying scene, all this stuff you can't do when you're a serious athlete. And then in Geneva became um, very serious again, started training, uh, running for the Hungarian national team and mountain running and winning a national championship and falling in love with the mountain races here. So at the time, I don't know, I think a good week was 100 kilometers. So, but I absolutely loved it. And I live in the, in the countryside a bit, so it's fantastic. But then as work ramped up and became serious, you really are thinking, well, Uh, if I'm not training for the Olympics, like what's the point, which I know sounds extreme, but 
Um, I didn't want to run races and then have my uh, former teammates look at my times and say, what happened to her? Uh, so yeah, really taking it a bit easier now, doing a lot more Pilates and yoga for mental health. Um, but yeah, I think within the next, I don't know, six, maybe six months or so, I want to start ramping up again. And uh, this mountain season, I think in Switzerland pro probably won't be good because of the virus, but then uh, next year, hopefully get, getting back on the circuit and getting serious again. Um, so you, you still consider the Olympics then? Yeah, but only as of today, because I thought it was it was a bit over. I'm not that old, but still for the marathon, you don't really want to be doing it. Um, and you're, well, late 30s is maybe still okay. But uh, yeah, I think my partner would also not be very happy knowing how much time you have to commit. Um, so, but now with this one year delay, it's just a question of Hungary, uh, because they have different process for how you qualify um, versus other countries. For the US, I couldn't run because it's, it's uh, far more talented than... Um, far more deeper, deep, uh, deeper talent, I should say, uh, than Hungary. So it's not going to happen. But yeah, I think I still have a shot. And, and do, you, do you use some of the learnings that you have in the sports in your career or personal life as well? Um, maybe. So when you were asking about setting up the business, and I told you this, uh, this experience of trying to set this up in between jobs, um, because my uh, parents are, I think, Eastern European, but grew up in the US, there's this culture or not grew up in the US, but we grew up in the US, there's this culture of if you fail, it's okay, it's uh, you can try again or do something else. And with running, it's a bit the same now. So I didn't accept failure. But now I think as a result of, of business learnings and failings, you don't take yourself so seriously, you try not to stress all the time. Because when I was competing, uh, I was terrible to be around just stressed, I couldn't eat, I was no, I was It's very different. And I think you, maybe the two complement each other. So yes, you're driven, you have to be consistent above all things, but at the same time, don't let it be a source of stress in your life. Um, I know if I start running again, seriously, it will become a source of stress, even if I try not to let it. So it's somehow trying to balance the two of having the, the mental space to get out and enjoy it. Um, but at the same time, yeah, performing well for yourself. But are you more stressed by these uh, sports challenges or by your uh, Definitely work Definitely by sports, for sure by sports. Because <laughs> everybody's watching you and you can't hide because your results are published. And, and uh, at the same time with impact investing, especially when you're working on your own, if you do screw something up or, uh, I mean, your reputation is all you have. So if you lose money for a client, that's something that, that can be explained away. But if you do something unethical or, um, or they're unhappy with you and tell others, it's a, yeah, you have a really just one chance. So it's a very different kind of stress, but at least it's not public. And uh, I don't know, your classmates can go download your results for the year. Yeah. And let's jump on, on the failure part. You said it, it was for you kind of culturally accepted uh, so that, that was part of your family um, philosophy and, and the sport is definitely also a big part of, of that learning as well. Um, now in business, did you have some big failures uh, over the past few years and, and what were those and how did you overcome those? It's hard because I work with very close relationships with clients. So um, generally you build a relationship of trust and learning with each other. So if... I don't even know if things, it's not about things not going well. So with one client I work with, we worked on a lot of direct investments. So investing in early stage businesses often um, primarily in Europe. But like I said, my advice is usually very conservative. So if the company is overvalued or really not um, completely sound, in my opinion, I advise against it. Um, we have gone ahead anyway with investments where the, the step then is to monitor and keep the companies on track as much as possible. Now, to be honest, some of the companies are not succeeding. And so it's a, yeah, you take it quite personally because you want to push these companies and help them any way you can. But um, oftentimes it's not something one person sitting in Geneva can do if you're not uh, sitting with them in the market and talking to the customers and consumers. So it's, yeah, I mean, business failure is part of the day to day, especially for startups and early stage businesses. But still, it's it's something that uh, I take very seriously when it comes to the direct investments of my clients. And at the end of the day, it's not my money, which is why it's even more difficult. Um, there's failings, probably less right now, because I'm not looking for new business opportunities so actively. But uh, when you apply for things, or when you send proposals, and you spend hours, and it goes nowhere, or when you uh, tried to pitch for new family businesses, you spend 
easily weeks in meetings and traveling and, and the time educating them and then it goes nowhere and it gets frustrating. But I think, yeah, I guess these are all failures, but I just haven't considered it in that way because it's just a part of doing business. Like if you were launching a new product and it didn't work, but then you change the flavor or the packaging and suddenly it works. So um, yeah, maybe it comes with trying to be better about identifying those opportunities so you're less likely to fail or only applying if you know you're going to succeed. Um, I don't know, but uh, yeah, I guess it's a normal part of, of like running um, a business month to month. I think it seems normal to you, but I think for a lot of other people, it's not like they would see all of these like failures and you would you see it more as learning, learning opportunities, actually. And at least that's how it sounds uh, for me. I'm, I'm a bit the same. So I'm, I also am also very positive usually and tend to see all these failures as learnings. Uh, but sometimes when I talk to people, they, they do perceive it as, as just failures, actually. No, and it's true. And to the, add, the learning part. especially when you're just starting out, it's true. I was not so easygoing. So Maybe in the first couple of years when you don't get new mandates or, I don't know, you don't uh, uh, get a very positive review from a client or you think you did a great job, but they think you did an okay job, then you take it very personally. Um, but then I think you're, you're more strapped to figure out your cash flow and, and where money is going to come from and work for the next month or three months. So, yeah, then it's, I think, a bit more serious and not so lighthearted. Um, it seems like a long time ago. It was not such a long time ago, but um, no, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, and, and if um, now you have an investor that is considering uh, the impact investments, um, what would you tell him for like a first time impact invest investment for a first time impact investment? Sorry. Um, so I'm working with a family in that situation right now uh, through their advisors, actually. And they are ready to make their first impact investments. Uh, but the opportunities that they're looking at, I think, are, are quite risky. Uh, they're high impact, but still really early stage, so venture capital type. So I would look at it really in a portfolio context. Um, if it's a one-off investment, then I think it really needs to be conservative um, in a, a growth stage company if we're going direct um, and well thought out from that perspective. If they have significant assets and a well-diversified portfolio, I think it's okay to take some risk uh, depending on how much they want to invest. Um, and, uh, so I really, I enjoy doing due diligence, um, and then trying to offer every angle for them to consider. Uh, but oftentimes like with these, with this family now, it really is, well, how much impact are we making? And we're not that concerned if we lose some money, if it's only, if it's a very small percentage of our assets. So, uh, I think it comes down to their mission on one hand, and then also how it fits into their broader investment strategy. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And and on the other side, what would you advise to impact entrepreneurs trying to raise funds? How how should they pitch? What or or what should they focus on? Earlier now, yeah, it maybe is a little bit soft, but it's about telling the story well. So having a clear narrative. There are many entrepreneurs that are really making a positive impact, and and they they want to be doing it, but they're not communicating it well. So I'm thinking of a like a food business that really focuses on, on local ingredients and being embedded into the community and, um, and working with the government and doing a lot that they don't consider impact, but just part of their day-to-day. -day. And I think when you bring in that extra angle, it really helps investors understand the more personal side of how business is conducted. And um, if you as a business are a good corporate citizen, I think it also makes you much more attractive as an investment opportunity. So Yeah, perhaps yeah, it's soft. It's not a financial skill, but maybe it is the storytelling and just considering um, how sustainable you are and what you're doing day to day. So I, I think uh, I I don't have more more questions. I would love to to discover a bit more about uh, the work that you're doing and, and going into more more examples. But I don't want to take too much of your time as well. Uh, I really enjoyed the, this, this first discussion with you. Uh, I think that was extremely interesting. You have an amazing background, which I was not aware of at all. Um, you are extremely driven, curious, like you said. Um, I learned also about your, your stories of, of your family. I think that explains also part of why you're doing that today. And it's, that's very inspiring, I must say. Uh, so th thank you really so much for, for your time. Really appreciate it. I uh, hope you, you enjoyed it um, as well. Uh, and I don't know if you want to say a, a last word maybe on your side. Now you put me on the spot. I, I was pretty prepared. I had thought about the other things, but no, for those that I, first of all, thank you because it's very, it's very kind of you and I really appreciate it and you taking the time to speak with me. 
Um, I guess the only thing I would add is if for those that are interested in the sector and discovering more about the space, there's impact in, in everything that you can imagine. So um, helping to save coral reefs or fighting viruses or, or now saving rhinoceros, something I'm working on, um, or indeed helping refugees. So whatever you're passionate about, I'm sure there's a way that you can combine it with uh, investment opportunities and, and helping others uh, as well. I'm doing it in a commercially beneficial way. So yeah, I would just encourage people to, to keep discovering um, how they can bring their passions and their, uh, investment, um, their investment drive to life. So thank you again. I appreciate it. Excellent. So hopefully we'll have uh, more impact So maybe together also in the future Definitely. and uh, and we will have the chance to see you at the at the olympics in one way or another <laughs> let's see i probably uh, shouldn't have said that because now there's pressure <laughs> but uh, we'll see you next year excellent thank you so much so that's it for uh, the seed stars podcast today thank you all for listening and please do not hesitate to subscribe to seed stars podcast thank you all thank you for listening to our hero's journey And subscribe now for more stories on Seed Stars Podcast.